I'm really happy to be here with Brigitte. Um, Brigitte and I met on Focusmate, believe it or not. And um, and then, you know, it was great. I mean, like she, she teaches uh, vegan cooking and healthy cooking, plant-based cooking, and has such a passion for it and has been educating um, lots of people on the internet about this stuff for years. Um, so her passion is empowering busy people who care about their health, the planet, and compassionate living to help them cook simple meals made with love and without recipes every day, which is very interesting. We're going to have to talk about this. So, um, Brigitte, uh, we have a lot to talk about. We'll just dive right in. Anything else you want to say about your background? I mean, the fact that you're a mom and anything else. I am a mom. And something that's maybe kind of unique about me is that I come at this from a background as an academic. I'm trained as a sociologist of research or a sociologist of science and higher education. And so being grounded in some kind of evidence continues to be important to me. But at the same time, I, I retired. I like to say I'm a retired academic. <laughs> I retired from academia because it was... Um, frustrating in many ways that we had all these grand ideas, but often we're not doing a whole lot about them and often took a, um, an approach that was, uh, you know, isolating little pieces of knowledge without seeing the big picture. And I find that in my work, I get to move now between, you know, zeroing in on the really basics of how to chop an onion because it's really important, but also zooming out to, the big picture of how this fits in contemporary life and late stage capitalism and all that. And I, I, I really enjoy myself. I've been at this now since 2015, 2016. And I, for a while I thought, oh, this will just be for a few years. And now I'm, I think I'm in for the long run. All in. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and you have generous uh, amounts of content on social media that people can can learn a lot from and enjoy. So I will be sure to put those links below. So folks, be sure to check that out. And um, you guys have a very helpful website too. So uh, be sure to check that out. And you've got, and I'll, well, we'll talk about your um, your offerings later on because I think you have some great offerings for people, um, myself included. And But I want to start with um, the fact that there is tons of, I guess, recipe or yeah, recipe content and cooking content and uh, nutrition content online. And it's just like with any online content, it's easy to get overwhelmed. And, you know, some people might even like enjoy watching these things, but then do they really apply it? And so just wanted to get your, get your, get your take on it, especially because you, you say that you help people cook without recipes. So what does that mean? Yeah. This has been the core struggle for me of my identity as a food blogger um, or what, what is it that I am? What do I do? Am I a food coach or a recipe blogger? And even if just within the relatively smaller niche of like vegan cooking or healthy vegan cooking, if you search Google for a vegan mac and cheese recipe, there's as of two years ago, something like 30 million, you know, hits on Google. And there's, you know, of that, there's probably thousands of actual recipes posted by bloggers for vegan mac and cheese, you know, and do we really need one more? <laughs> and I don't think so. But for a, a number of years, I was really struggling with this idea of, you know, how am I going to differentiate myself in that? And I took photography courses and I'm for the life of me, not a visual person. I tried um, to improve my photography, but I, I really disliked it. Like it, it made me uh, feel like bad to, to tr even try. I don't mind doodling. Uh, thanks to another colleague, uh, Ingrid's uh, programs. I, I kind of enjoy that, uh, but it's not going to be my, my main thrust into this, right? And so realizing there's all these recipes and even before the internet you know, came about, look at cookbooks. How many cookbooks does a person need in life? And every cookbook pretty much promises that it's going to be the one. You know, of course, there's a specialty cookbooks about, you know, Korean cooking and how to make fancy baking items and stuff like that. But there's a, a huge market for cookbooks for 
fast, quick, uh, healthy in 10 minutes or less, eight ingredients or less, you know, all of those cookbooks that are clearly, and I I, I don't think they're in bad faith. Those cookbook owners are, are trying hard to help people find out what they can make for dinner in a short amount of time, because we live in this busy society that doesn't make a whole lot of room for important things like self-care. And I think the ultimate form of self-care is what you put in your body, but that's my bias. Uh, but so all of those cookbooks out there, and I own a bunch of them, and I many of my clients own dozens of those cookbooks. And are they cooking? Not necessarily. Are they watching videos of people cooking on YouTube? Oh yeah, a lot of them. And I just wish people gave themselves a chance to realize how much they actually know about cooking. When you set aside the books and set aside the internet and you think about it for just one second, you actually know a lot more than you think. You, you've seen soup before. If you use your brain, if you don't jump right away to Google, um, you know, search for a soup recipe, well, you know, there's some liquid and some vegetables probably. And if you're plant-based, well, there's going to be beans, for example, and you can make soup. It may not be the best soup in the world because you don't have the most experience yet, but it will be a pretty good soup. And once you start really engaging your brain in the process, you very quickly realize that making soup is not rocket science. Even making good soup is not rocket science as long as you start understanding the, the just basics of seasoning and the basic combinations of ingredients you can put together. And once you're bringing your full awareness to the process, not letting Google, Chef Google boss you around with recipes, you can start making a lot of progress very quickly. Yeah, I love this. And you're, you're essentially empowering people to be more self-reliant um, and not have to rely on, you know, well, to be able to rely on their own their own wisdom uh, and experience, and um, so so you know what that means is your um, advice and your guidance uh, is really kind of helping them understand the, I guess maybe the interactions and the system, right? The interactions between ingredients, perhaps, and yeah. and the system with which to you know, uh, go about their cooking experience, something like that? Yeah, I think understanding, sometimes I use the word, the grammar of cooking, maybe it's more the syntax of cooking, but just if somebody, I'm, I'm not much of a musician, but I know enough about jazz to know that there's this thing called standards and, um, Au Claire de la Lune is a French one. Um, I don't know, a hello dolly probably is a, is a standard in a way. And so many, musicians kind of riff on those same combinations of chords or similar progressions. And you hear the new song and you recognize the original. And in the same way, cooking has some standards. And I'm not talking about restaurant grade Michelin, you know, starred, wow, fireworks in your mouth kind of cooking. I'm talking about the stuff we have to eat every day to you know, to build ourselves and survive and not just survive, but thrive and be nourished. And, you know, there's soups, there's stir fries. I'm not good at them, but there's casseroles, which are apparently a great way to use leftovers, but I don't like firing the oven that much. So um, that's not for me. Uh, there's what I call roasted things. I used to talk also about this over that, you know, pasta with some kind of sauce on top. Um, there's things you hold in your hands, like burgers and sandwiches. And when you think about those, again, in a more systematic way, you see you can you can learn about the components that they have. And also there's flavor profiles, which kind of cut across the other way, because every soup or every stir fry or every sandwich can have a more curried kind of Indian, you know, spice flavor style. You can have more Tex-Mex things or some more Japanese or some more, you know, usually culturally inspired. And we have the chance of having access thanks to the global food system to so many seasonings. So once you know how these things work together, um, you can start making those combinations. And that is what I try to teach people is to not only... Uh, 
um, use the recipes, but above that, to, to notice the similarities from one dish to the next and just pay attention and taste the things. And it's really hard to completely wreck dinner, especially with plant-based food, unless you're burning the thing to oblivion or dumping the salt shaker into the into the pot, you know, it's probably going to be okay. Maybe not great, but if you're noticing what goes in and what comes out, then you taste it. And the other beautiful thing about cooking uh, vegan food is that it's not going to kill you if you eat the food raw. You know, there is very few opportunities for poisoning yourself. So I, I always get my clients to eat the cube of raw tofu and they're like, is that okay? Actually, it's already cooked. Um, but like, yeah, you can eat it it's not, and you're going to notice that it doesn't taste like much. And then you eat it later and you notice the texture has evolved and you can always, you know, cook and nibble at the same time and, and learn more as you're paying attention. So really seeing seeing those repetitions. And the beautiful thing about cooking is that um, you're going to do it thousands of times. <laughs> and I don't know if that's a beautiful thing or not, but it's kind of like the idea of the maintenance phase for people who are in the weight loss arena um, where, you know, it, there's the challenge of learning, but then for the rest of your life, you can continue on improving a little bit, but you're going to cook dinner, um, you know, 300 and some times a year for 40, 50, 60 more years in your life. And that's so many opportunities to learn and to nourish yourself and to get better at it. I love that. I, I, I love your passion for it because, um, right, like a lot of us are, a lot of people do it as a chore. Oh, yeah, I just got to get, get dinner done. Right. I need to say I don't like cooking. Okay, so I know I kind of sound <laughs> like I'm passionate about it, but this all comes from the fact that uh, I don't like it that much. And as I was saying, you know, I think food bloggers, um, many of them love cooking. They they have that as a hobby kind of thing, and they want to turn their hobby into a business. For me, it was more a matter of my hobby, if you want to call it that. Something I'm more excited about is. Uh, project management and productivity and efficiency and mindset, focus, stuff like that. And I came to plant-based cooking because I was overwhelmed and I tried to apply those principles from my, my work as a project manager in academia and, and some more, you know, approaches like, for example, getting things done, um, David Allen or, or those bigger ideas about focus, productivity, even spirituality. I built that into my my cooking because I had to, because at the end of the day, it is so important. And once I recognized that, I realized that also maybe I'm a bit of a control freak, but I couldn't just farm it out to someone else because they don't love me and they don't love my family as much as I do. And the cost that we're facing as a society for having outsourced food to third parties that really just care about profit is enormous. The amount I was reading yesterday that among people, I want to say over 50, maybe it's 55 years old in the United States, over 50% of the population is taking five different drugs or more. Okay. So we're talking about meds for diabetes, for heart disease, you know, blood pressure, um, for some kind of um, stroke prevention in some cases. And then you have people that start to take Alzheimer's, um, drugs that actually don't work. <laughs> That's also the terrible thing. They, they work in giving negative side effects, but they don't actually improve the disease proper really. And it's mind boggling, not only the, the amount of time, but the damage that taking all those drugs does to us. And then when you take a drug, you have to take another one because there's side effects and so forth. Whereas almost over 80% of all that can be avoided or greatly diminished through a better diet. And I think that was maybe what I was coming from there is like, well, I don't want to spend hours in the kitchen, but I also don't want to spend hours in the doctor's office and walking, you know, half disabled in the last 30 years of my life. What do I do about that? And I also want to live a lifestyle that feels like it's in line with my values. And I also know that I can't really farm that out to restaurants or, you know, the large agro agri food corporations they they don't they don't care that's not their job to make me happy and nourished yeah wow wow this is really this is this is motivating <laughs> um and yeah I, go I, george I yeah right it's <laughs> make soup 
Yeah. So um, I want to talk a bit. So since you talk about the whole project management thing, and I also love that you you mentioned like this kind of like learning the grammar of things and therefore you're empowered to use the the letters and and the, and the words and pair them together in, in new ways rather than just like, well, it's relevant for me right now because I'm, I'm learning Spanish. I you know, moved to Mexico. I'm learning Spanish. And it's just easier. It would be easier for me just to memorize phrases and sentences and then just know how to say that in that situation. That's it. But then to actually be empowered to to be able to take those same words and put them in <laughs> new combinations in ways that actually are fluent. Well, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about here. And I, I love that you said we have so many, we have hundreds of practice sessions every year. And what are we going to do about it? And so I want to I want to spend a bit of time on this. Um, and then I want to I want you to share about what offerings you have because I think I think they're they're very affordable and they're they're worth worth uh, people knowing about. So. Um, okay. So considering somebody who is, um, showing up to the kitchen now and, or, okay, just even like, as they start to think about their, their cooking rhythm, um, how, how should we think about it as, because I don't know, I, at least in my household, it's kind of like, all right, gotta, gotta get dinner made by X, Y amount and time. And like, okay, I got a half hour. Okay. Let me just, and so it's kind of just, it's, it's often very haphazard, you know? Uh, there's not much project management involved, except except like in the moment, like oh yeah, that's right, I got to do this first, <laughs> you know. So so what's your I guess maybe some guidance about how do we systematize it and 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 look at it as a practice? Yeah, there's two frameworks that I think are are helpful here. The first one is um, a classic project management framework that says, and I hope I get it right. Um, there's money, imagine a triangle, and there's money, and there's time, and there's quality. And at any given time, you can choose two, and one of them is going to be neglected. If you have a ton of money, you can hire a personal chef. You know, if you're, I don't know, Ariana Grande, you can hire your personal chef, and, you know, that person will cook your meals, your specification, and it will still take time possibly to train them and to to supervise them to that stage. Um, but you will have high quality food and you will not be spending much time on it, right? If you have a ton of money. If you have a ton of time, you can do um, really high quality food for not very little money if you keep on honing your skills and improving. If you want really high quality food, you're going to have to pay the price one way or other. And I have to acknowledge first that there's um, many people that don't have the time or the resources and that are made to to be in a position where they have to make really substandard choices or they're not choosing at all um, because they, they just can't. Modern life is, you know, hammering them on and they have to keep multiple jobs in the air and care for, you know, young children and aging parents and, you know, everything is going kablooey and I don't want anybody to feel bad about that. Um, there's, there's reasons to rebel against the agro-pharma complex there, and I'm on board with that. But a lot of people do have the choice, uh, you know, and if you have the choice of spending an hour watching YouTube or Netflix or an hour in the kitchen, I say spend the time in the kitchen, okay? So that's, but understanding your priorities. So I personally have nothing against haphazard, um, as long as then you keep into consideration the second framework, which is... Um, the Canada Food Guide has really evolved over the years. And as of 2019, it's become an actual tool we can use because previously it was basically a corporate PR, you know, marketing exercise because the Canadian dairy industry and the Canadian meat industry were the main force present at the table when they were deciding how to make the food guide. And in 2018, 2019, the bureaucrats and bless their souls in Health Canada managed to convince their bosses that, hey, we're going to write a food guide without corporate influence. And the corporate people were not happy and they put tremendous amounts of pressure on the politicians to try to change this, but they did not succeed. And the beautiful thing is that we now have Canada's food guide, uh, which I'm working on making into Canada's green food guide to make it a little better. But what it says, simple framework, half your plate by volume, whichever way you want to think about it, should be vegetables and fruit, but 
vegetables. Let's say I like to do fruit for breakfast and vegetables the rest of the day, but whatever works for you. A quarter of your plate should be beans, legumes, and including bean products like tofu or tempeh and whatnot. And the other quarter should be whole grains. Personally, I think if you're eating only plants with a lot of beans and a lot of um, vegetables, it's okay to eat some refined grains because um, you're already getting a ton of fiber, so that's fine. Of course, the official Canada Food Guide says protein foods instead of beans, uh, but I think beans, uh, everybody should be eating, even if they're not vegan, everybody should be eating a cup of beans every day, like that's uh, eight ounces of, of beans, uh, or even a cup and a half if they can. Uh, it's the food that's universally known across the planet to keep people living long, healthy lives with their full minds uh, present, tons of iron, calcium, all the good stuff we need. So if you follow this framework, then you can improvise almost anything. And another concept that's useful too is continuous cooking. I like the idea of having the basics in your pantry, some of those whole grains, some of those legumes, and then some basic vegetables. You know, you always need onions, regardless, uh, carrots, uh, some kind of cruciferous vegetables. You need a lot of greens, but choose the ones that are in season. Choose the colorful vegetables that are in season. And then you can assemble those things from one day to the next into a half decent meal that again may not be causing your mouth to erupt in fireworks, but it will be, if you roughly follow those proportions, pretty darn healthy. Um, however, we've been trained to really enjoy um, those fireworks, to think that we need a ton of diversity. And that's why I do have a meal planning service where I kind of do that work for people, but um, adding a lot of diversity from one week to the next while staying true to those basic forms. Um, but in real life, I roughly follow my meal plans. Uh, I test, I use them really extensively for the first two years. And now I see, oh, it says soup. And then I open my fridge and I look what the vegetables are. So I don't need to decide that dinner is a soup or a stir fry or what have you. Um, because I've bought the right ingredients, then I just need to throw it together. And I think a lot of my clients that have been with me for a long time do that as well. Um, so we we think we need diversity, but maybe we don't as much as we do and as we think. And a lot of people that eat out a lot, if you ask them, you know, what do you eat out, you know, when you order in, what do you do? They always order the same stuff. <laughs> Yes, right. I know. <laughs> I, I I do. I mean, even even if I go to a restaurant, you know, once a week, I still want the the the, the thing I always like to eat. Yeah. Um. So it's comfort. I, yeah, right? it is. It is. Um. No, this is this is uh, this is all very helpful and inspiring and uh, and 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 delicious. Um. So I so if people are watching this and curious about what you offer, I want I want you to kind of talk through your your various offerings and so you can start from whichever whichever one you want. While you were talking about things being affordable, well, nothing beats free, um, which is, uh, it actually used to be a paid program and it's called the the Healthy Vegan Batch Cooking Club, whatever, it doesn't matter. So veganfamilycation.com slash cooking dash club. And I'll I put the created link below. that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I created that just for me at the beginning, because although uh, I preach batch cooking, I haven't touched on batch cooking yet, but when you don't have a lot of time, at 5 30 p.m you know before dinner maybe you have time at other moments of the week and if you want more diversity that's where batch cooking comes in if you want slightly more flavorful food that has a bit um you know bolder seasonings or flavoring profiles things like that it helps to do a bit of batch cooking at a time when you have more mental energy you have more willpower i could say as a shortcut um, so I, I'm a big fan of batch cooking to prepare some building blocks. Also, whole grains take a long time to cook. So if you start dinner at 5.45 and you want to eat at 6 because you have a meeting at 6.20, it's not possible to have brown rice or quinoa or things like that. So batch cooking has always been really important for me, but I was preaching, but I was not doing it. <laughs> and by creating the cooking club, I forced myself to show up. And it, I think it was inspired from Focusmate at the beginning, um, where it's like, you know, you book a Focusmate session, you have to go and do work. And so you book the cooking clubs, I advertise them. I guess I got to go. <laughs> and, and so I created this, this um, it's just a Zoom meeting every two weeks, Sunday afternoon, 
where I'm doing my batch cooking. I'm not teaching. And at the beginning, it was just my clients that could come in as an add-on to their meal plan subscription. Um, but now I've got a lot of people that don't know me at all, and they come to cooking club for the first time. And the funny thing is, almost every cooking club, there's a new person that comes, and we go around the screen, you know, saying, my name is Brigitte, I'm in Vancouver, and I'm going to cook ABC. And we get to this person, and they say, my name is uh, Cindy, I'm in Hawaii, and I'm just going to watch for today because I don't know what to cook. And I'm like, sorry, you got to go. Oh, <laughs> there's one rule in cooking club is you got to cook. And usually what I offer to them, I don't kick them out right away. I say, listen, I know you have things in your pantry that you can cook today, that you will be very happy to eat Tuesday or Thursday or later this week. And so they open their pantry and we find something for them to cook. And uh, over half the time they stay and they do it. And often they're not very skilled. They, 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 you know, they were not prepared for this, but they're so glad they did. And they learn so much more than if they would have watched a bunch of strangers. First of all, it's kind of creepy. Uh, <laughs> you know, they watch all these strangers cooking. Uh, they wouldn't have learned a whole lot. They wouldn't have, they might've felt even bad about, oh, I can't do that. I don't have the skills. Look at all these people that know what they're doing and I have no clue. No, you do have a clue and you can do it. So cooking club, number one place to hang out with me in the kitchen. Um, and at the beginning, it was me and like two other people. And uh, last week there were over 20 and it's becoming a little bit unruly. I'm, I'm starting to think of ways we can make that work, but it's also so wonderful to have the community of other people who also care about really good food. So that's where my heart is. Um, but other things I do, yeah, I do have a meal planning service um, that's called the Vegan Family Meal Plans. And there's also a mini plan version for people who cook for one or two. And sometimes they say, I just cook for me. No, you're the most important person. You're cooking for yourself. That's super important. So there's a mini version of the meal plan. Uh, for them, I do monthly workshops that are free. Sometimes the replay is available for a cost. Sometimes I don't bother. Um, and I'm working on a new course. There's a course that I've had since 2017, but I'm working on a, on a new course that I'm very excited about that is called Plan, Prep, and Relax. And it's going to be all about leveraging meal planning and batch cooking for people who do want to understand that grammar of cooking that I was talking about. Combine it with batch cooking so that they can have a cut above, a step above meals every week that are on the one hand quite simple, but still a little bit of extra nutrition in there um, compared to just, you know, keeping things super duper simple, um, but that they don't need to get to Wednesday night and feel frazzled about what's dinner going to be and combining a basic but solid knowledge of plant-based nutrition, what they need to, to thrive on a plant-based diet and just those basic cooking techniques, but not just the cooking proper, not the part that's in the kitchen, the part that's at the dining table, planning your meals for next week, uh, making your shopping list and deciding what to make, finding out what's in season, uh, keeping things economical also, because the cost of food can be very high, especially when you waste 40% of it, which is the average food waste in, in North American households. So once you understand how to use what you have, it also gets a lot cheaper. Amazing. Some this, is, I do. this is so great. Um, oh, when, one more yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, one more yeah, thing. Please, please. The hundred days of flow in the kitchen. So in, in thanks to your guidance, I wrote this lovely book called uh, Flow in the Kitchen Practices for Healthy, Stress-Free Vegan Cooking. We have it, we have it right to, to your left. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's right here. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to make this really easy to digest. And I've written, it's not probably 60% is original content, but it's connected to the philosophy of the book. And it's all these little things you can read in one minute, all of them. You can read them in one minute or less. And there's one per day for 100 days. And it's really the easiest form of learning there is. You know, you get the email, you read it, something will stick with you, especially if you do it every day. Because many people, when they go down this route, they feel isolated. Um, I have a client who at age 41 has not cooked anything in his whole life until we started working together. And wow, his family, a, yeah, 
was the same. He's been eating out since he was a kid, you know, um, eating stuff that comes ready-made all the time. Another client told me, oh, I went to this family gathering and I brought whatever, a dish. And she's the only member of her family that still cooks. And I just want to, you know, rip my hair off, but that's just the, the world we're in. Um, but so having these reminders every day in the hundred days of flow is reminding you that there's somebody somewhere who cares. That's me. Um, and, and that thinks it's important for you and that wants to nudge you in the right direction to reclaim, reclaim your food, reclaim your health, reclaim your, your focus on the things that really matter in life. Um, and so I really love the hundred days of flow in the kitchen. Yeah. Oh yeah. I definitely will be linking to that below as well. And I just want to tell everyone, I, from what I experience of you, Brigitte, you really do care. You know, you care about your students, your clients, your colleagues, your friends. And, um, yeah, so I, uh, I, I love that this is really a, a mission-driven, values-driven business that you're creating. So, so awesome. Authentic I'm probably business. not going to be a millionaire from this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, but you that's never okay. Know. You never know. You <laughs> that's never know. okay. That's um, okay. So I will be sure to link to uh, these, all these different things that we're talking about below. Um, of course, I hope people will sign up for, you know, your email list so that they can hear about the, the new course, which sounds amazing. I will definitely be looking at that myself and um, my wife and I. Uh, but you have you know, to do it. Don't yeah, just do sign it. up, George. Exactly. You have to actually do it. <laughs> do it. You have to actually do it. I know. I know. Um, yeah. It's it's what 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 has happened is like my I've ended up cooking the breakfast and my wife mostly does the does the dinner. That's good. So so That's I think fair. I think I think in the course I think we'll have to take it together. Um, so thank you, thank you for your work and your your heart in doing it. And um, I hope people will, will, you know, make use of these wonderful resources that you've, you've given us. So thank you so much. Thank you for all the inspiration. A lot of that, I think, came together and gelled um, my more recent ideas when, when I started listening to you more talking about joyful productivity. And it's, it's the same stuff, you know, we have to write content and you can, you know, step into it, dreading it and. Oh, you know, I have to write another right. blog post. <laughs> or you can say, no, it's important. It's my ministry yeah. and it's my way of sharing and, and sharing love with others. And yes. the same thing applies to cooking. So a that. lot of those ideas somehow yes. come from you. So thanks I, to you. I, I love that. That's that's a wonderful reminder for me as well. Yeah. Bring bring that intention into into the preparation of the food. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Brigitte. And folks, thank check you. out the links below. Thanks.